Well, thank you, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Greg DeSherry, and I had the privilege of directing and producing the film that you just uh, watched or maybe you watched earlier this week. Um, I am going to be your facilitator tonight for this conversation. We're very excited to have it because when Emma and I set out to make this film, we wanted to make a great film, but we really wanted to make a film that sparked conversations and brought people together. And so we could have a good you know, dialogue around youth mental health, around suicide prevention, and ba basically how to enhance things in our local areas as well as across the country. So again, we're going to get started. We have some great panelists assembled for you tonight, and we're going to have a great conversation. If you do have questions, like I said, please feel free to use the Q&A tab or the chat feature. You can drop them in the chat, and we'll be um, answering those. We've got people from New Jersey, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Sulphur, Louisiana. All right, and that's in our area. Connecticut, great. Wyoming, Illinois. People from all over the country, so we're we're uh, nationwide tonight. So thank you for that. So we'll get uh, we'll go ahead and get started, and um, we'll we'll start introducing our panelists here. And I will start with Miss Nina Hataspi, who is a therapist and who um, also is really one of the driving forces, from what I understand, about getting the group started, the teen support groups at DBSA. Would you mind introducing yourself and telling you a little bit about what you do and why you're passionate about this work? I think you're on mute, maybe. Okay, there we go. Um, so my name is Nina Hakowski, and I am a licensed clinical social worker in Pittsburgh, PA. I saw somebody from Westmoreland County, so that's that's real close to Pittsburgh um, in the chat there. And so um, I've been working in the mental health field for 20 years with teens and adults um, in a variety of settings. I've been in residential treatment and um, I've worked in inpatient settings and worked a lot in, in outpatient settings. And, um, you know, I really became passionate about um, suicide prevention and um, learning and implementing um, treatments for people who struggle with suicidality about 15 years ago when I started working in a pediatric bipolar clinic. Um, because part of what I saw through that work was that you know, when you are providing validation and support and understanding and help with developing coping mechanisms for, for dealing with pain that is just crippling and that creates so much suffering, um, people can find a way out of their suffering. And so it's been an honor to bear witness to that and um, has really driven most of what I've done in outpatient care, uh, like I said, over the last 15 years. And um, and I like working with teens in particular. I kind of started working with teenagers right out of college in my first uh, job by chance. There was a job available at the residential you know, facility kind of down the road from my house. And I got plopped on an adolescent unit um, and, and I've been hooked ever since. You know, there's such an explosion of emotional and cognitive and physical and psychological growth at that time. And it's overwhelming. And so if you add stress and mental health symptoms on top of that, it's just such a tough field to navigate. Um, and so I've really enjoyed helping people to, to navigate those crazy fields. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. And um, we have a, a, a new doctor here, uh, Lauren Yang, who comes to us via the uh, Young Adult Council, but she's also just gotten her, uh, her doctorate, I believe, in uh, psychology. Is that correct? Would you mind introducing yourself, uh, Lauren, and telling why you're doing the work you're doing? And we'll yeah, up. definitely, Greg. And that is correct. Yes, I'm a newly minted clinical psychologist. Um, and so that's my day job. But uh, yeah, as Greg mentioned as well, I'm currently serving as vice chair of the Young Adult Council for DBSA. So I've had the privilege of being able to serve on the council for the past four years now. Um, I joined uh, during, I think, just the start of my uh, the second year of my grad pro school program, um, I think uh, that would have been eight or nine years since my diagnosis of bipolar 2 disorder. So I speak on my lived experiences with bipolar disorder, uh, being on the council. Um, it's been great work um, to be able to speak on panels like this, to contribute to blog posts, um, podcast episodes through D DBSA. So uh, really just been such a great opportunity and um, honor, like I said, to be able to 
you know, speak, um, you know, using DBSA's platform, but also, you know, so to the question of um, why I'm passionate about this work, you know, I think, you know, similar to what Nina was speaking to of, you know, just being, bearing witness to the, um, to people's struggles at such a vulnerable time in their life. And so for youth, you know, I think it's such a critical developmental period, um, you know, for all of us really. And so in working with like college students as well for a good amount of my training, it's been um, kind of mind blowing to just hear about how much they are under like pressure and stress they're under. So it's not just, you know, anxiety, depression, kind of, you know, what we typically hear, but really just like a wide range of things and the existential questions that they come to face with also at that time in their life too. So yeah, that, a lot of that really motivates my passion for this work. Thank you for having awesome. me. Thank you so much. So glad you're here. And Karen, the social media director, coordinator at uh, DBSA. Yes. Uh, hi. So my name Oh, sorry. Oh, go right ahead. Okay. So my name is Karen. I'm the social media coordinator at DBSA. Um, I actually found this job looking for support groups of my own. Um, in 2020, I was diagnosed with general anxiety and major depression. So I have been working with a team of therapists, not really finding the right one. I had gone, I think, three years looking, going maybe through five therapists. I found the right one and she recommended support groups for me. Um, I ended up finding one. I ended up finding DBSA, saw that they were hiring. Um, and I'm super passionate about all this uh, mental health advoca advocacy uh, because of my lived experience. And I am a child abuse survivor. So hearing what we're doing to talk to children and teens and what we can do to give them the, these resources that I wish I had growing up um, and in, I think this year, a few months ago, I actually was diagnosed also with borderline personality disorder. So just being able to be around people who are dedicated to helping young people not necessarily have to go through so much trauma because they don't have these resources or their families don't really know where to start and what to do. Um, I'm happy to be part of that and be part of a team where on social media, we are just spreading awareness um, and having these difficult conversations that need to be had um yeah had mm -hmm. awesome thank you so much uh miss emma would you like to say hello to folks yes of course absolutely hi everyone um what an honor to be a part of an event like this with people from all over the country it's so cool to see like everyone from all over the place it's really awesome um and as you kind of saw my journey unfold my passion really grew after having my own lived experience and then kind of like what my panelists was sp were speaking to as well just, just of seeing kind of how bad my peers were struggling same as I was and also the flip side of it how how when I got the help and the support that I needed I was able to overcome those thoughts and those feelings and so my passion really grew kind of in my recovery journey um, I didn't really necessarily choose to start sharing my story. I just kind of fell into it in a way because initially I wanted to express myself through journaling, which is an outlet that we all advocate that people use if it works for them and it worked for me. And so to see kind of how my journey unfolded with just using an outlet that is recommended um, and how it's grown to this magnitude of being able to help people to this degree is truly just continue to fuel the fire and the passion inside of me, as well as, you know, everything I've learned, all the people I've met, the stories I've heard, um, the testimonies that I've experienced, just all of that in culmination truly is such a hot fire underneath me that is burning bright with a passion to really advocate for this topic that needs more advocacy, needs more attention. So what an honor it is to have you all joining. And I want to start by thanking everyone for taking the time to view the film and to join this conversation tonight. Why, thank you, Emma. Thank you, Emma. Uh, and just to introduce myself a little bit. So uh, I am not a full-time filmmaker. I uh, have worked in the mental health field for the last 15 years. I got into the field through my own lived experience as well. When I was 25 pursuing a dream of working in film, I had my first uh, manic episode while living in Los Angeles and was hospitalized and diagnosed as bipolar with co-occurring substance use disorder. 
I spent uh, many years in and out of mental hospitals, um, you know, due to my bipolar disorder, <laughs> even have, you know, issues today was fairly recently um, hospitalized with, the uh, you know, bipolar flare up with things. And, you know, and I share that because I think it's important for people to know that a lot of times, you know, we might have these struggles, we can still do great things, we might have some ups and downs and recovery is not always a perfect uh, climb to the mountaintop, but, you know, we, 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 we keep on keeping on and we can really, um, you know, inspire others by sharing our stories and, and sharing <clears throat> our lived experience with others. And also by working in the field, you know, I started a youth group back in 2007 for the company that I worked for for 14 years, Magellan Health and had the opportunity to work with young people who experienced mental health issues. A lot were in foster care. And, um, and that was a big part of it, you know, encouraging them to share their stories, to share their experience, to inspire others, because, you know, this can be a very isolating uh, thing, having uh, behavioral health issues and dealing with these challenges. And so for people, one, knowing that they're not alone, but also knowing that um, just because you have these challenges doesn't mean you, your goals and dreams and, uh, you know, can't come true. So, um, so I figure we'll start it off again. We will be taking some questions. I see we got a couple come in already and we'll get to those. Um, and, but I did want to just um, start and maybe Karen with you, if you wouldn't mind, and then go to Lauren with kind of a similar um, question, like how has your lived experience that you've had with your own issues with behavioral health issues, um, what made you decide to use that experience to now work in the field, helping others, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so growing up, I always knew that there was something off about me. I was sadder than my friends. I was just not as excited about things. And I felt really alone. So once I got diagnosed and once I realized that what I experienced was depression, was anxiety, was all these other things, I was like, people need to hear about this. The weird things, the things that like sound super stigmatized. We need to destigmatize them. We need to normalize having these conversations. And I'm the kind of person that once I get into something, I dive right in and I want to do as much as I can. So once I realize I have the knowledge to share all these things that I wish I would have known, I think that's what really made me want to continue talking about it. Awesome. Thank you. What about you, uh, Lauren? Yeah, you know, for me, after having my first hypomanic episode, um, it definitely wasn't like an immediate decision to, you know, start sharing, disclosing my uh, uh, experiences, you know, with others. If anything, it was very, um, as you said, Greg, like isolating in that way of, you know, I wasn't sure who I could really tell this to, who I could really talk about this with. Um, so it's been a journey for me, for sure, of, you know, over the course of the, you know, past eight, nine years, again, like I said, being diagnosed, it's, um, you know, been such a process of like, not only um, through DB, my position on YAC through DBSA, like being able to um, speak about these lived experiences and hear to be able to have reflected back to me, um, how affirming or how uh, validating it's been for other people to hear that, oh, you know, someone like me um, has gone through, you know, uh, bipolar disorders, uh, uh, symptoms or experiences. So, you know, hearing that, and then also in the line of work that I do as a clinical psychologist, just, um, I definitely use that to fuel and mo drive myself further and just how to be, you know, present, being empathic, really just, um, trying to ground myself in that, you know, we all have this common humanity to our experiences. Like we're all human with, um, thoughts, feelings, and, you know, real struggles. And so that's what I try to use in my line of work and how I help people. Awesome. Hey, would you mind sharing a little bit about the uh, Young Adult Council and your experience with that and what y'all do? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So Young Adult Council, um, you know, it's a few of us, let's see, it's for folks aged 18 to 30. So we um, do a lot of th different things of, you know, cre uh, creating resources for young adults, um, usually based off our lived experiences or speaking directly to our lived experiences. Um, I know there have been blog posts about, you know, questions to ask when you start looking for a therapist or, you know, um, how to navigate, you know, your for like identifying the early signs, you know, of a mood episode. So we definitely um, draw upon our lived experiences towards that work. And we meet together, you know, every 
month or so to be able to talk about how we're developing these resources, how else we can connect further with the community that DBSA serves. So yeah, it's uh, really enriching work to be able to do through YAC. That's awesome. That's awesome. Hey, and Emma, so we got to see your kind of journey of coming to tell your story, you know, through the blog a little bit in the film and then and speaking out. Um, you know, question people often ask is, is what keeps you doing it and sharing your and story? And is it something that's still difficult to do? Yeah, well, it's never not going to be difficult. I mean, um, kind of being vulnerable uh, very often and kind of conjuring up those feelings again to be able to fully empathize and sympathize and relate to someone who is in that in this current moment kind of getting on the level and the floor with them, if you will, is always challenging. And it's never something that's necessarily fun, but it's always very fulfilling. And it's always so worth my time and my energy because of the fact that this problem still exists, because of the fact that this stigma is still such a big issue um, and something that I felt so deeply, and I'm sure Karen can relate, um, just from hearing a little bit of her experience that I never felt like my problems and my feelings were big enough for to warrant the way that I felt about my life. Um, I'm not sure if that's translating correctly, but to put it in layman's terms, I felt like the only people that deserved support and treatment and help were people who came from severely troubled backgrounds, extremely broken homes, who experienced great trauma, um, I assumed that those were the only types of people who really needed this type of attention and support. And so I neglected myself. And I know that a lot of other young people in particular feel that same way, that they, their situations aren't as bad. So therefore, they're not given the right to feel a certain way. And because that issue is so prominent, and I see it constantly when I go to schools and speak to students, like that is the most prominent issue is the fact that people don't feel like their problems are bad enough, but yet they feel, they don't think that their problems are bad enough, but yet they feel like it's the end of the world. And so it's a big problem. And I just have seen that sharing my story and getting on their level. Um, while it's always challenging, it's always so worth it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Nina, um, obviously you're a supporter of, uh, you know, of people voicing, having that lived experience in your work with helping to establish the team lines. But as, as a clinician, um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, your experience helping people and how how it can also be beneficial for um, clinically, maybe even for people to hear stories of others that are uh, recovering? Yeah, you know, Emma, as you were talking, I was like looking at some of my notes that I took during the movie. And, and the first thing I wrote um, touches on what, what you just um, were talking about in terms of feeling ashamed about your feelings. And you said, I was always ashamed of how I felt. And so I think that that's a big part of what we address um, in therapy and clinically, you know, is addressing that shame that people feel about, you know, the feeling that they're having at all, sometimes the intensity of the feeling, you know, and so what I always say to my patients is that your feeling is, is valid because it's real to you, um, no, no matter what anybody else says. Um, and the intensity in which you are feeling it is real to you. And so sometimes the, the, the biggest thing we have to do is address that shame and kind of tackle that shame about um, how, the, how the person is feeling. Um, and so, and in just doing that, I think there is some validation and I'll tell you what, I mean, that's part of why I'm, um, I really jumped at the chance to, um, help out with these support groups because validation is that I always tell my patients, it's a superpower and it's a win-win, you know, if you can validate someone, if they can feel like you understand them, and then you hear them like that is a rewarding experience for you as well. And so, you know, the healing goes both ways then, um, and so, yeah, I think clinically, you know, just that um, helping people to understand and identify um, and validate their own feelings is it's crucial when when you're dealing with suicidality. 
And what could someone, you know, ex expect maybe if they come to you or another um, therapist and maybe they're, you know, experiencing suicidal thoughts or depression or anxiety, what's, what are kind of some steps for maybe somebody who hasn't been to therapy or doesn't, is it maybe a little apprehensive because they don't know what to expect? What could they expect? Yeah. So when I'm doing a suicide assessment with somebody, I always start by saying, you know, sometimes when people are upset um, or people are feeling depressed, these are thoughts that they have. So I do a little bit of normalizing um, because I think that's part of the, the problem, um, you know, with stigma is that like people just aren't talking about these kinds of thoughts and experiences. So I try to normalize it as this is something that happens sometimes when people are upset and stressed and overwhelmed. Um, and what I also really want to understand um, is what is the function? You know, what, what is the function of, um, uh, what would the function of dying be? Because I think, and this was really highlighted well in the documentary, you know, when people um, engage in suicidal behavior, it's not about wanting to die, it's about wanting to escape pain. And so, you know, I really try to understand like what is feeling these thoughts and what is the function of the behavior and to like start to give that language to my patients and their families as well. Um, and so I think that is all part of like understanding. Um, and when we understand stuff, it's less scary. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and there's some great comments and very sweet comments coming uh, about the film and Emma in the chat. Thank you for those. And, uh, you know, Amy brought in a, uh, a comment as, you know, as well as a lot of times um, we can feel like, you know, there's so much going on in, in, in society. And obviously some of us are from a place of, of privilege and have more than most, but a lot of times that what Emma was describing. So uh, vividly, I experience as a lot as my well as myself. Well, I have it all going on. I, you know, I have all these things and privilege and I, you know, I have a college degree. I have a family that loves me. I shouldn't be feeling these ways. There's other people that we just validate our feelings and, and really can keep us from asking for help for that stigma that we do have in our head where you think, oh, you know, a person experienced mental health challenger who needs help looks this way or, it, you know, presents this way. So I think it is so important to re remember, you know, we have that segment in the film, um, the middle, mm -hmm. you know, no one is, no one is exempt, but some people, you know, some populations are impacted even more, but, you know, it can, it can really um, address anyone. Um, so, um, let me see, we got some questions coming in. Um, and we'll kind of bounce around in our panelists too. feel free to ask questions as well. If, if Nina or Lauren or, or um, Karen, you have questions you want to ask. But um, one question for you, Emma, was, was your suicide attempt planned or was it more of an impulsive act? How would you answer that one? So it was definitely an impulsive act. Um, I, from the time that I had my first actual suicidal thought, like thinking of um, methods and a plan, um, which those were very fleeting thoughts. They would come and then they would go pretty quickly because of how much shame I was carrying behind thinking that way. Um, was about a month before the actual attempt. So um, to give a little context of the time frame, I had been experiencing suicidal ideation type of thinking for a period of years prior to that, obviously completely unaware that that was what my brain was doing, but um, it was a month before. So the actual act itself was an impulsive decision. It was not something that I woke up planning to do that day. Um, just the events, the way the events unfolded during that day um, ultimately led me to making that decision. And it was an impulsive decision, which I think kind of speaks to the point of how intense my regret was. Thank you, Emma, thank you for that. Um, and that, So a question we came in from Melissa, can maybe all of us can kind of speak to it, but can you speak to ways for parents to add voice to normalizing talking about suicide in ways that don't violate their children's um, privacy? You know, parents have it uh, tough these days to say this, you know, to say the least, and it's a difficult conversation to have. One of the things that's been, um, real encouraging with the film is when parents and kids see it together, it kind of gives them that opportunity to talk about this stuff in a way that's not quite as awkward as it is to just bring up the topic out of the blue. Um, 
but Nina, what would you what would you say to that uh, question for for parents of how can they kind of normalize some of this conversation, but still not you know violate privacy or things mm -hmm. like that? Mm -hmm. So how to normalize it in conversation with their own children? Yeah, how can parents have conversations? Yeah, yeah. you know, talk about it early. Start early, um, and I, I think that's a really important part of normalizing. And don't be afraid to ask. You know, I think that that's another thing that I really appreciate about, about the documentary. You know, was the discussion about asking if you're concerned. You know, if you notice that your child is isolating more, if they seem sad, if they seem stressed out, you're not going to put the idea into their head. Um, and I think framing it as this, these are sometimes thoughts that that, that people have um, when they're feeling overwhelmed. And so I'm just wondering if any of that is popping up for you. And I think there's so much of it in the news and there's, you know, kids are talking about it in school. Um, and so listen you know, listen to what's being talked about in your community, listen to what's, you know, going on on social media or on the internet and, and use those opportunities um, to start a discussion with your child. But I think starting early, making sure you ask if you have any concern um, and just using what's going on in the community to, as a platform to start the conversation. Great, great. And uh, do um, Lauren or Karen, did you have anything you wanted to touch on that? And I'll, or Emma, as far as parents talking to their kids? Or yeah, when that question was first asked and I was rereading it, I wasn't sure at first if it was about, you know, normalizing um, within the community, like the broader community without maybe like disclosing too much of their, you know, if assuming, you know, the child is um, dealing with suicidal thoughts, like, not violating their privacy in that sense, like not to disclose too much to the community, but still adding their voice. So I'm not, so I'm, I was going to answer in that way and please do let me know. Yeah. It, yeah if no, it's off base, but you know, I think um, when speaking like to more broadly, like within the community um, and being respectful in such a way that, yeah, you don't have to um, share anything that's you know too personal or feels uncomfortable or feels like that would uh, you know violate your child's privacy in any way you can talk in generalities or like speaking I think from the how the experience may be impacting you like from your personal experience I think that could be really powerful um so you know like citing maybe a little bit of you know what context contextually might be going on but I think, um, yeah, that's one of the most powerful things. I think that's what we've all been like maybe bringing up here too and why Emma's story is also so powerful and incredibly inspiring is, you know, being able to speak from our personal experience and having, you know, people connect with that in, in a way. Yeah, and I'll just speak, I'll add to that point. Um, I think there, naturally, we're all very aware of how much stigma is around just the word suicide itself. Um, anytime, at least in my experience, a person passes away by suicide, it's whispered about and it is um, hush hush. We don't we don't talk about that. And so I think getting to a point as a society um, where suicide is as normal as heart failure or 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 any other um, very normal common illness that a human being experiences um, that isn't shamed. I think once we get to that point and once we continue to work towards destigmatizing suicide as a whole and acknowledging and recognizing that it's just a part of the human condition. Unfortunately, sometimes people experience these types of thoughts and feelings. And the quicker we accept that it is a normal human reality and it's not something that only certain types of people go through and only certain groups of people experience, it's a human being thing point blank period. So I think as soon as we can kind of really push that narrative um, and get people to kind of see that perspective, things we will have like, I don't want to say the problem will continue, but I'm just saying like, that's where my goal really is, is just to completely erase the stigma because in all realities, this is an issue that doesn't discriminate. So I think just all in all normalizing it in your home, in your workspace, in your friend group, um, just all together in your life um, could only 
push the, the narrative more forward. And if I can piggyback off that, I think an important thing to remember is creating a safe space for someone to come to you. Sometimes people don't want you to pry, even if it's someone you really care about asking, are you okay? Are you okay? Is not always the best way to go about it. Creating that space where you can allow them and validate them. I know that's something we had been talking about without trying to fix their problems and allowing them to just know that you are a person who will listen without being overwhelmingly worried and just showing some concern, no really advice. Sometimes people really need just someone to listen. And I think by offering that space, it'll allow people to feel more comfortable talking about that. And slowly but surely, it'll build into something where it really is a lot more normalized. Great point. Yeah. And Melissa clarified her question a little bit. And I think the, the what we um, have been discussing is great and very important as well. But she was clarifying that she has her own recovery journey in in supporting her daughter who's doing well now, but she struggles with being able to share her own story as a parent without violating, you know, the confidentiality of her daughter. And I would I would say two things. One, um, you know, you have a story as well, and it is your your story. And so I think you're sharing your story can really help someone. I think if maybe you can have those conversations with your daughter and see what she comfortable or your child what comfortable what she's comfortable with you uh sharing and i think like was said earlier um lauren said you know you can keep it very general and don't have to get into specific of things but i think to remember it's you know it's your it's your story too it's your truth too and if you feel like you need to share from your perspective i think that's a good thing and i think you can definitely probably help a lot of um a lot of people um and here's a question um well, there are a couple of people who asked, uh, Mr. Pollock had asked, so we're glad to have uh, our CEO of DBSA on uh, on line with us tonight. But um, he had a question for Lauren, and I imagine this could go to Nina as well as, as um, an active therapist. But his question, Lauren, was how do you decide how much to disclose, um, you know, personally about your lived experience? I know, uh, particularly in older schools of, of thought and therapists and code of ethics, you're not supposed to share anything, you know, but it's so valuable for people to know in the right circumstances that you might have some of that lived experience. How do you balance that? Yeah, and thank you, um, Michael, for that uh, really great question. It's, it's such a, you know, I mean, obviously case by case basis, but how my decision-making process through that, it, it's kind of changed over the course of time too, as I've come to understand my bipolar disorder better, as I've come to be um, better able to articulate my experiences, better have like the word and language with which to describe these things. And so, you know, I'll first say that um, as far as like disclosing to colleagues or like, you know, um, even supervisors, uh, people who, you know, higher up I'm working with, it's, it usually come. it's not like, it, there has to be kind of like a contextual reason. It's not usually something that I open up with or I imme immediately introduce about myself. Um, I just, you know, I consider it part of, you know, um, my li lived experience. I don't consider it like who I am necessarily. Like I know for some people, their identity is intricately tied. And some people even say like, oh, I am bipolar. Whereas for me personally, it's something I have bipolar disorder. So that's just my, you know, personal take on it. But, you know, so it really, there has to be a reason of like, oh, you know, I'm especially struggling or like I need the additional support from my colleagues or supervisors so that, you know, my work doesn't continue to get um, impacted severely in any way so that I can continue to do the best work that I can. So that's one way. And then as far as, you know, with, clients or patients, you know, that is such a <laughs> delicate uh, thing of, you know, because I never want to be inserting myself too much into my sessions with pa uh, patients, like that's their session, that's the work is, you know, on them, they're focused on them. So, you know, there was one time that a patient had looked me up online and had discovered my diagnosis through, you know, like things that I posted or um, published about. And so, we had a conversation with each other and it was helpful for me to understand better, you know, just his, um, he had, a, he was uh, working on something different, but, you know, just for us to have a better mutual understanding of each other. So it was helpful in that way. 
but yeah, just to wrap it up. It's like, you know, it's not something that I take lightly, you know, it's really something that um, has to be for the benefit of my patients, like treatment, ultimately, if it's going to be therapeutic for them is how I think about it. Thank you for that. Nina, do yeah. you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would piggyback off of that to say, you know, when <clears throat> I'm sharing, you know, anything about, you know, my own, you know, struggles with intense emotions or, you know, for me, you know, there's a struggle with anxiety, anything I'm sharing, I'm really mindful about how is this in service to the patient, you know, and, and I want it to be beneficial to them. And why am I sharing this thing? Um, because sometimes our patients say things that we really relate to. And when we really relate to, there's an urge to share, you know, and that that's part of how you build closeness and connection with someone. So it's a unique relationship where the closeness and connection is essential. Um, but the but the sharing is lopsided and, and you want the sharing to be really intentional. But I, I give lots of examples about, you know, some of the problematic things that I do when I'm dysregulated. But um it's all in service of trying to code, you know, um, you know, teach a coping mechanism. Um, and to, you know, to Emma's point to say, like, this is part of the human condition, you know, trying to figure things out, trying to, you know, um, cope with stress. Um, and so I want to be really human, but, you know, be really intentional about how I share. And it's subjective to Lauren, to your point, it depends on your relationship. Great. Thank you for that. We got lots of great, great questions coming in. We're going to try to get to as many as possible. One for Emma, in the months uh, and years after your attempt, are you able to explain how your mental health improved? Do you had anxiety and depression before the attempt? How and why did it improve afterwards? Was it tools, techniques you learned afterwards or God's work? Or some people take years to get better. I'm wondering how you improved relatively quickly. Well, I did not improve relatively quickly, although it may have seemed that way because of the film. Um, it took a lot of time, a lot of effort, um, and a lot of patience. I think part of the reason why I was able to start off in a different position was because of the experience that I had went through and the regret that I felt. Having that feeling of regret really showed me that for myself personally, no problem is too big. No feeling is too big um, to take that's worth my life. And so that regret spoke such volumes for me personally. Um, and it just, it, it has constantly been my anchor. So that regret I felt anchored me through the depression that I still very much had and the anxiety that I still very much deal with on the day to day. Um, I'm not free and clear of struggling with my mental health. Um, as I said earlier, I'm still human and I'm still living life. So I still have challenges and feelings and big feelings. Um, but the difference is now that I have been able to work to get to a point where I know that when I get to a certain point, I know what to do. I have a, a set of coping skills that I've gained through therapy um, to kind of break down some of the more logistical ways that I kind of recovered. Um, immediately after I left the hospital, I started seeing a therapist. Um, actually, while I was in the hospital, I was seeing a Christian counselor. And that kind of started my journey with therapy and talking about my feelings and expressing myself, which prior to my attempt, I was I had never done. So talking about my feelings and getting emotional was something that was so foreign to me that it felt wrong. Um, but over time, working with my therapist and just like Karen, I had to shop around for a therapist. And I don't think that's a bad thing because it's a human thing. You have to be able to relate and connect to your therapist. So I shopped around and I went through several, I think four or five until I found a good one or one that worked well with me. Um, and I stuck with her and she's taught me so much. Just all of my therapists have taught me so much as well as, like I said, knowing that I got to the very worst point um, and feeling the regret and having the gratitude of living, all of those things in com combination um, really kind of propelled me on a mission to just really figure this stuff out. Um, and, and that journey really showed me that it doesn't have to be 
the way that it was for me. You don't have to struggle in silence. You don't have to um, suppress your emotions. You don't have to feel things alone. And so really just opening that door um, is kind of why my healing journey was able to happen in the way that it did. But um, it took work. I definitely had to remind myself every single day how important my life was and what I was fighting for and had to constantly speak positively to myself. And that took work. So um, please do not think that just because I had a suicide attempt that things magically resolved themselves and I magically was perfect. That's not how it went down. Um, It was several years of hard work and a lot of self-reflection. But I've come to a point now where I feel mentally well and mentally capable to withstand life's challenges. Thank you for that, Emily. Yeah, it's a, the magic of movies. It looks like things happen overnight sometimes, but uh, but yeah. Um, so uh, Tammy had a question here and I want to kind of maybe generalize it a little bit, but she had, ex- had expressed and I, I appreciate her putting in the chat and people are giving her some very thoughtful, uh, supportive uh comments here and resources and that and that's great i think that's what this is so cool about dbsa is that it's you know it's really a community you know and a community of people that are supporting one another who've been there but the question is about you know she's experienced a traumatic experience of uh of losing a child or a child not being in her life anymore a lot of people experience traumatic things um in their lives that can often lead to mental health symptoms or uh, even suicidal thoughts or suicide attempts. I know, Karen, you mentioned kind of in a little introduction, you experienced some trauma. Um, but maybe you could start us off, Nina, with how do we how do we deal with some of these uh, traumas that life throws at us to um, overcome and, you know, persevere through that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, you know, there are such a wide variety of experiences that can be traumatic um, for us. And sometimes it's pervasive and it's repeated, you know, sometimes it, it's it's isolated. And so I think, you know, a, a really, really important part of moving forward is understanding how those experiences affect you today. Um, because you can't change what has happened in the past. Um, and sometimes we got to go back there to get some understanding about, you know, how those experiences have shaped us and, um, you know, how they affect us today, but then really kind of tending to the emotions and the thoughts um, and the the struggles that we're having in the present, because those are things that we can take control of. Um, We can find new meaning, we can find new ways to cope, um, we can find new understanding and and that can help us to move forward. So trauma is really, really hard to move forward from, and it's really impactful, um, and it and it impacts us all in different ways. And so I think um, you know that's sort of I've, I'm a big advocate of the forward-facing treatment um, with trauma that we dip into the back to gain understanding, but then we really want to figure out how do you move forward and how do we cope with where you are now because that you can control, and that's kind of empowering. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Karen or Lauren, did you want to touch on that at all or anything to add? Um, I think with coping with trauma, the one thing that I found really important was to remember it doesn't matter how long ago the trauma was. It doesn't matter if your friend has gone through something worse. You've heard a story of someone going worse, what you've experienced changed the way you live your life the way you process things and that's okay um it's nothing to be ashamed of and it's important to know that sometimes you need to walk through your past in order to understand why you are the way you are today and that there's nothing wrong with who you are today your trauma it's changed who you are but it doesn't make you a worse person I think that's like an important thing to just kind of keeping that back of your head when you're um, recovering from trauma. Great. Yeah. And just finding that, su- <laughs> that support out there and, you know, and, and talking about it and, and recognizing that it is significant, you know, oftentimes we think of uh, trauma and it's, it's getting better, but we think of, you know, PTSD you hear a lot, but you think, oh, that's just for people who are the war. And then they say, oh, well, maybe it's somebody who's just been sexually abused, but trauma can come in all 
forms and fashions like Nina was describing. And, and it's really something that can be difficult, extremely difficult to get through by yourself. So being able to talk to somebody, uh, support groups are great for that, getting into a therapist for, with that, uh, talking to loved ones is all really, really important things. There's a couple questions <clears throat> um, on si around signs and what to look out for for teens and also you know, what to kind of say or do. Um, and maybe we'll start with you, Emma, because the question was was kind of about what would what would you, what could somebody have maybe done or said uh, at school or family that that might have uh, made a difference in you not attempting? Um, well, I think <clears throat> I think when I was really struggling when I was sixteen. Unfortunately, I had gotten to that point over a period of years struggling in silence and feeling and invalidating my own feelings and my own thoughts. So I don't necessarily know that one thing could have made the biggest difference, but I do know that if someone would have approached me and asked me the and had the conversation with me based around um, suicide and suicidal thinking, um, I would have then felt the green light to be able to open up um, that conversation and talk more intricately about my feelings. But I think that's hard to answer because of the context of what my life looked like at the time. And I think that what really would have prevented this and could have prevented this um, would have been just from the very start um, a mental health, not being so stigmatized, not having this great shame around talking about your feelings, feeling big feelings, dealing with stress in a different way. All of these things that I grew up like thinking were wrong. Um, I think had I just had a different understanding of my own mental health and just mental health in general, things would have looked much, much different for me because it wasn't like I wanted to feel the way I felt. I didn't want to deal with the feelings that I was dealing with. I didn't, I didn't choose to feel that way. I didn't choose to think that way. Um, but I didn't know that talking about it and getting it off my chest and opening up that conversation would result in me feeling better eventually. Um, so I think had I known that, maybe if someone would have shared that piece of information with me, um, then things may have looked differently. But it's hard to say because hindsight's 2020. So I think a lot of things um, came into play and could have been differently to have a different outcome. Thank you. And there was a, sim a similar question from a teacher wondering, like, how can they support a student what can they do it's it's one of those tricky you know situations uh even if you have training around it but if you don't if if you don't have training or don't know what to do um nina would you and then maybe uh, uh lauren and karen could chime in on this what would you what would be your advice to that kind of uh teacher other than you know getting some suicide prevention train types training would be uh, a great you know first step but what would your or a step yeah, so I agree that would be a great first step is ask your district to get some good training and support into the school um, uh, for all of the teachers. Um, you know, I think making yourself available, you know, and paying attention. If you observe some changes in any of your students, you know, if any of them seem particularly stressed, you know, or if their emotions seem really big, or they're getting, um, you know, like I think Emma, I keep thinking about your movie. And so like that example of you get a bad grade on a test. And if you get a bad grade on the test, then you might get a bad grade on the exam. And if you get a bad grade on the exam and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. and it can take you into a really desperate place. And so it may not be a big deal if your student has gotten a really bad grade on, on a test, but it's a big deal to them. And if they're expressing it in that way, you have to take it seriously. And so I think it's really about paying attention and observing and just letting that kid know that you're there if, if they need to talk. 
um, and, and verbalizing that to them. So I think it's the observing, you know, it's the extending your hand um, and it's asking your district to support you. Great. I emailed our superintendent and our school district about the Hope Squad right after I watched the documentary. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Wonderful. <laughs> Did you have anything to add, uh, Karen or Lauren or Emma? Um, if I can add anything, it would be that um, it's obviously sometimes a little hard to have these conversations, but again, creating that safe space where you remember you're not a therapist and you're not supposed to be this child's therapist, but it is very helpful when you allow them to sit with these hard feelings, but also remind them that it's okay to have these feelings. Um, if you're feeling that spiral of, if I get a bad grade, I'm going to like fail the exam, I'm going to fail the class. It's okay to have those feelings and to be uncomfortable, but remind them that there's nothing to be ashamed of for having these feelings. I think that's really important, especially for younger kids when they feel a lot of shame for feelings that they probably were never taught how to manage. So allowing them to feel okay or compassionate towards themselves about these big feelings and creating that space for validation where you can say, that sounds very rough. That's very difficult. I can understand why you're feeling that way makes such a big difference in a child's life. I'll just add something really quickly. It just popped into my mind as she was speaking, which I agree with everything that has been said from just my perspective. Granted, I'm no parent, I'm no teacher, but um, I think it's important to always remember and have in the back of your mind, if you are in an education role, that um, the kid, the reason that the child might be struggling may be because of the parents. Um, and I know that's something that people don't really like to talk about, but I, I meet with a lot of young people and I speak to a lot of teenagers, especially, and it's, it's overwhelming how many of them struggle because of their parents and their parents are influencing their struggles. So I think knowing that sometimes the home life might not look the way that you might envision um, is, is important as well, because sometimes you're the only adult in that kid's life that they feel safe around, that they feel comfortable talking to, that they just feel a comfortable connection with. Um, so just constantly remembering that, that, you know, you never really know what someone's home life looks like and to not just assume based on things that people make assumptions about um, is really important. Um, so I don't know if that helps anyone or if that kind of goes unheard, but I just felt com compelled to say that. You know, I really wanted to echo, well, first, I also resonate and really agree with uh, what's been said already. And, you know, kind of going off of what Emma and Karen were just mentioning about, you know, keeping in mind um, other things that may be going on for um, a child at school. But also, I think a lot of anxiety or, you know, it feels like there's so much pressure or like the onus of responsibility is all on us individually, like in whatever role we may be playing um, for a child or a youth. And I would want to impress upon people that you know, it's not all on you, like, it's, um, like, definitely, you know, pulling from your own, like, resources or your own support network, like, whether that, yeah, like, be the superintendent or whomever in the school system, but, yeah, I think it can be uh, huge, not only to validate and also open up space, but also equipping kids with knowledge and uh, how to access resources for themselves, because I think that can be empowering, as well. And I know that that can be a huge barrier for a lot of, it's just the lack of knowledge really. So. Thank you for that. And we're running close on time here. We got lots of great questions, some of which we're not going to, um, not going to get to, but um, we will try to maybe answer some of these in, uh, maybe we can do a follow-up email, some of uh, one, and I'll just kind of answer. Um, Alyssa had a question for uh, Nina and Lauren, just about, you know, having a bunch of she wants is interested in being a therapist, but worrying that it might be a little bit triggering uh, for her because of her own experience. So I don't know if maybe y'all want to drop something in the chat of, about that or, or something that would be great. Um, another question was <clears throat> about the media reporting and kind of normalizing talking more about it. In the past, um, you know, there had been studies, particularly around celebrity suicides, when it was like not when it's really sensationalized in the media that they did see a spike in suicides. Um, 
however, in these kind of situations where we see when it's when a story like Emma's is coupled with a story of hope and recovery and sharing of resources, it has a really positive effect. They call it the, the Papageno effect, where it can really have a positive effect on um, helping you know prevent suicides. So as we wind down, I wanted to give each of our um, speakers a chance to kind of leave us with some some parting words or, or thoughts and maybe we'll start with uh, with you, Karen. What would you like people to take away from this event or uh, this evening? Uh, it's definitely, there's nothing to be ashamed of for feeling what you feel. As alone as you might feel, you're human. We experience things, we experience things that we're, we shouldn't experience, but with healing and recovery, there is resilience. And even if you think there's no way of getting better, there is, and there's a community out there, you just have to find it. And as a, you know, it's okay to not be okay. Thank you for that. Lauren? I'm sorry, I was answering Alyssa's question. So parting oh. words, right? Like things yeah. to take away from. Um, yeah, just, um, you know, I think it's great that we're you know, um, having these conversations and um, just continuing to have the dialogue, continuing to open up space. Words matter, language, um, how we talk about these things is also so important. Um, so it can seem maybe um, straightforward or you know intuitive, like oh, don't invalidate someone, but you know, truly, it can make a huge difference to just have that open stance, non-judgmental stance, being like, oh, I hear you. I can ima only imagine how that must be for you and how tough that is. So just wanted to say that too, that just how we talk about things is important. Great, great. Yeah, and, well, um, before, you, before you answer, I just want to say if um, uh, Maria or, or maybe you, Karen, if you can start, there's getting some questions about how can people get involved with DBSA? How can they uh, make a donation to the, this cause? We are doing this event as a fundraiser to support DBSA being able to have more support groups and more resources for youth and young adults. So if we could just post all those links in the chat, that would be great. Nina, go ahead, sorry. I was um, just kind of like, I wanted to reiterate what Lauren said about words do matter. And um, I think, you know, not I think, I know, um, that suicide is scary and, uh, it's a, it's a pretty profound loss to experience. Um, and so if somebody is having those kinds of thoughts, they're suffering. And, um, even if you don't quite understand, just listen and seek some understanding and be curious, um, about the, the, you know, the kernel of truth and what that person, um, is experiencing in their life, because we all understand emotion. Um, and I think that these thoughts are very much driven by painful emotions. So try to understand, kind of tap into that place where you've had that feeling and um, and listen and, and be there for the person that's hurting. I think those are the most important things you can do. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Miss Emma, do you have any uh, words you wanna leave folks with? Yeah, everything that's being shared is so great and um, honestly hits all the points that I would want to leave everyone with. So um, I guess to sum all of those amazing points up, just um, understanding that while everything that was shared is a hopeful thing, um, I don't want people to get discouraged um, because <laughs> they've been trying to get better and it's just not happening. Um something that I had to kind of learn the hard way is that recovery takes time and healing is not linear and you're going to have bad days in good weeks and you're going to have good days in bad weeks. And that's just the nature of life. So please always remember that healing is not linear and that each and every day is a new day and you take it one day at a time. The goal that I have for myself each day when I wake up is to be 1% better than I was yesterday. And if you keep keep thinking like that, that one day at a time, and you just keep moving forward, you'll get, it'll get better because it does get better. And over time, gaining coping skills and learning things about yourself that help you feel better 
um, find joy within yourself, all of these little things that over time you'll become good at and they'll become habits for you. Um, it's possible for all of us to get to that point. Um, I'm, I'm living proof that it's possible. We're all living proof that it's possible because we've all survived 100% of our bad days. So just know that um, it takes time, but it's okay because you've got this. And thank you all so much for joining and sharing all of your love in the chat. I've been constantly reading the messages and the support that you offer one another. It's truly inspiring to me. So I really appreciate you all for viewing the film with such open hearts and open minds and um, really just helping to advocate for this issue. And each and every one of us can give ourselves a pat on the back because this is actively suicide prevention in and of itself. So thank you. Thank you for that, Emma. And yeah, and um, there was a question about Hope Squad. Um, you know, we think it's an awesome program. And for myself working in the field of youth mental health for so long, knowing the peer-to-peer -peer component is so huge. If we're going to ever make any significant impact in reducing uh, teen suicides and really just teen and youth hopelessness, we have to involve more young people in the process. So that's what's so great about the work DBSA is doing with their Young Adult Council and now starting teen support groups, peer-to-peer uh, -peer groups. It's vital. So again, you know, we encourage you, if you can, to make a donation to DBS DBSA through the gift um, button on the screening platform. Uh, we'll drop that in the chat. There's a donate button. And we've also <clears throat> decided to extend, the film was supposed to end today to be able to view, but we're gonna extend that one day. So if you haven't finished watching the film or if you have someone else that, uh, you know, think really needs to see it, we will allow the film to be viewed virtually um, through this platform for one more day. So through tomorrow. Um, and we just really would love your support from the film perspective of, you know, following us on social media, liking us on social media. Um, we're really still in the early stages of this journey of getting this film out there and wanting to get it to as many young people and as many communities as possible. A lot of communities are hosting screenings around the country <clears throat> and was doing quite a bit of traveling, traveling to some of those. Um, but we really seen it's a great conversation starters and some, you know, data and outcomes through some surveys that we've gotten from young people has been pretty uh, pretty amazing to see, you know, just what it does to really increases young people's empathy for people who are experiencing mental health issues. It gives them more uh, skills and they feel more equipped to help a friend who may be struggling with suicidal ideation or, or just struggling in general. And they also uh, are more likely to ask for help themselves after, you know, participating in one of these. So um, really, you know, just whatever your support you can have as far as helping spread the word and helping more people get to see this film. We would love that. And uh, again, just wanted to thank DBSA for all they do on a daily basis to support people like myself and uh, living with mental health issues. And they have lots of great programs. The support groups are fantastic. So I encourage you to, you know, click some of those links we've had in the chat or just visit the, the website and learn how you can get involved in some of those or support some of those. A uh, big shout out to uh, Maria and the team at DBSA for organizing all this for us uh, tonight and to uh, to Michael for his leadership over there at DBSA. And um, yeah, and huge thank you to our to our panelists, Karen and uh, Lauren and Nina did a fantastic job. And thank you, Emma, for uh, you doing a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. as well. so, thanks, everybody. Appreciate y'all uh, joining and I Soon we'll send a follow-up email to everybody who attended and can maybe share some of those uh, resources that we talked about uh, tonight as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, shameless, I was going to say shameless plug, follow DBSA on social media. We're at <laughs> DBSA Alliance or DBS Alliance. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.